webinar series. This is Larissa from Corporate, and I will be your host for this webinar. Today we will be feature, featuring Jim Roxburgh and Jason Close from Dignity Health as they present on their telehealth experience. All right. Jim Roxburgh is the director of, for the Dignity Health Telemedicine Network. He is responsible for the leadership development and coordination of this program. In three years, Jim advanced the Dignity Health Telemedicine Network from four to more than 30 partner sites or hospitals. Dignity now provides telehealth services in the acute ambulatory and home setting with approximately 1,000 consults every month. Jim has an undergraduate degree in exercise physiology, respiratory therapy, nursing, and a master's degree in public administration with an emphasis in health practice management. He is currently licensed as a respiratory care practitioner, registered nurse in California, and credentialed as an exercise technologist by the American College of Sports Medicine. Jim has worked in a variety of management and clinical areas, including but not limited to cardiopulmonary, neurodiagnostics, cardiac cath lab, electrophysiology lab, managed care, case management, and disease management programs. Jim is a fifth Dan Taekwondo master and a martial art instructor at Kang's United Martial Arts College in Sacramento, California. And now Jason Close. Jason Close is the program manager for the Dignity Health Telemedicine Network where he is responsible for the leadership, day-to-day -day operations, and program implementation. In three years, Jason helped to advance the program from 15 partner sites to more than 40 partner sites or hospitals. Jason has an undergraduate degree um, in psychology as well as respiratory therapy. He is currently licensed as a respiratory care practitioner in California. Prior to his current position, he served as the clinical specialist and manager of the respiratory therapy department at Mercy San Juan Medical Center in Carmichael, California. A father of three, Jason spends most of his free time with his family. And if the opportunity arises, he enjoys motorcycling through California's gold country and coastal mountain ranges. We will begin our webinar shortly, but first, a couple of notices. Uh, one, please note that when you logged into this webinar, you should all have been auto-muted. If not, please make sure to mute yourself. It doesn't sound like anybody was not, so I think we're good. Uh, two, during the webinar, you will be able to enter questions in the questions module located on your GoToWebinar dashboard. Questions will be answered at the conclusion of the presentation, so please feel free to ask your questions at any point throughout the webinar. Uh, remember, this webinar will be recorded and a copy of the recording will be available on our website. A link will also appear at the end of the webinar for you to um, copy or click on if you'd like. The webinar presentation today should last about 60 minutes. That does include the time for questions and answers. And now, without further ado, here are Jim and Jason. Thank you, Lorenza. Welcome, everybody. And uh, you're able to see the, uh, our slides now. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start off yep. with the, uh, uh, our program goal. It's very simple. It's to provide timely access to high quality specialized healthcare services that are not readily available. And we like to say we lead with service and we deliver on quality. There we go. And uh, I won't read these, but these are uh, some of our guiding principles uh, that we have set for our program. Really, uh, to summarize them, we are uh, patient-focused. Our, 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 uh, our, our job is to get the specialist to the patient to deliver uh, the quality care as rapidly as possible. And that's the beauty of the, uh, the uh, uh, technology that we work with and, and the opportunity that we have to reach out to many patients. I'm going to go through a few uh, slides to give you an overview of our network. So uh, we were founded in 2008 from a generous grant from the Elliott Foundation. They initially wanted to help deal with uh, hyperacute stroke. In 2014, we were recognized as the Dignity Health Telemedicine Network. Dignity uh, has about 40-some hospitals in California, Arizona, and Nevada. 
Uh, we now have uh, 80 endpoints. Uh, some of them are the, the, the platform is the InTouch Health platform. Some are the actual robots. Some are the uh, uh, devices you, you push around, and some are the devices you carry around. Um, but we, we refer to all of them as robots or endpoints. We have uh, now a little more than 52 uh, specialists uh, providing services and 11 different services. Uh, we're in uh, 40 partner sites. We have, I think we've got about five or six uh, uh, implementations that are in the queue right now. And then last fiscal year, we, uh, uh, we did almost 12,000 consults. And I, I, I do need to correct on my introductory statement. I started in January of 2014, and that first year we did 160 consults. And we're on target this year to do, I think, over about uh, 20,000 consults. So the, the need is uh, definitely out there, and we've been pleased that we've been able to participate in helping that. So just to sort of uh, summarize our services, uh, on the acute side, uh, mental health is actually our highest volume service right now, stroke, neurology, critical care, et cetera. And then uh, we work over across the continuum into the clinic, into a transitional care, and then even into the home. And the technology we use, the, our main platform is InTouch Health. We use a uh, secure texting, texting system uh, called OnePass. And then we have a home solution, uh, Care Innovations. We actually use InTouch and Care Innovations. They sort of cross over in the home. And then uh, Airstrip is a, uh, is a technology that allows for pulling uh, waveforms and vital signs from the bedside monitors, uh, bed, the monitors in the ICUs. And we've got a project going on to, as an adjunct to our tele-ICU program where we're, we're linking in Airstrip. And then Doctor on Demand is a consumer-driven model that uh, Dignity as a whole is in the process of rolling out. So across the continuum, uh, we, we provide services. Uh, actually, it's a pilot project uh, where the ne neurologists are beaming into the, uh, uh, the paramedic vehicles in the field, getting a, a jump on doing the uh, telestroke assessment. We're services in the acute setting, and these are the different devices that we use. Uh, primary care, clinic, long-term, home, we're, we're uh, working with three skilled nursing facilities. And then, as I mentioned earlier, our home program. So the, the uh, goal of the program is to get the doctor to the bedside rapidly. So and this is a sort of a, a, uh, uh, a, a view of what it, what it looks like on our tele-ICU program. Tele-intensivists would see the patient. If they have a need, they would laterally consult with a tele-neurologist through the secure texting and have the ability to connect with the tele-nephrologist all around the uh, focus on the patient. The footprint of our sites, uh, about a third of our hospitals are non-dignity hospitals. We, we call our uh, spoke sites partners because that's truly the way that we approach things. It's, it's connecting great clinicians to great clinicians all around the care of the patient. Uh, one of the things that we're very proud of is being uh, very practical in our workflow, and we work very hard to drill down on it. And just to sort of give you an overview of how the program works for the day-to-day -day workflow, when a partner site uh, activates an internal alert, they call the Dignity Health Transfer Center. 888 number, and the transfer center will page out to the specialists on call. And they've got their schedules uh, listed on their uh, desktop, of course. The transfer center specialist pages the, the specialist on call. The, the specialist on call uh, responds back to the transfer center. They will either, uh, they're either called directly or they page them and then they'll call back to the transfer center. At that point, the telespecialist is patched into the partner site, uh, usually the emergency department, or it can be the ICU, or even the floor, depending on the, the patient case there. And they're speaking with the local physician, the partner site physician. Um, if need be, uh, we are able to query the images at the partner site and the, the uh, telespecialist, such as the intensive care doctor or the neurologist, they are able to see the images on their 
uh, their control station or their desktop as well as the patient through the video conferencing and then they're able to do their documentation. Uh, we refer to this as clinical apps. We work with InTouch to create a, a clinical app for the different services. They complete their note. Uh, that's sent to the hospital. In some of our sites, it's dropped into the chart. In other sites, it's, uh, it's actually faxed uh, pending the ability to get into the chart. And then we use this to create reports and for quality review. And you'll get a sort of a glimpse of what that looks like in more detail later. And I'm going to, you can take this one, you want me to? Uh, you I'll do rest okay. Of okay. I'm going to, this is Jim, I'm going to carry on. We got uh, Telestroke slash Teleneurology. It's interesting that what started out as a hyperacute program has uh, graduated into uh, Teleneurology in addition because some of the partner sites don't have access to this kind of expertise. And uh, we all know in the medical field you can't do a neurology consult uh, uh, through the robot, you can do a good hyperacute evalu stroke evaluation, but you can't do a, a hands-on evaluation. So this really becomes a, a, a case where we work with the local uh, physician, usually the hospitalist or the ED physician, and we sort of guide them through the process for those cases that tend to be teleneurology. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, last year we, we did almost 12,000 consults, 4,300 of them were telestroke consults. Our uh, page to the neurologist and call back is about two minutes. Our beam in time is less than 10 minutes. And I want to go through the process because I'm sure for most of you this is where the rubber hits the road and this is what makes the difference in your programs. And this is something that uh, Jason and I have worked and our team has worked very hard on trying to refine over the years. Um, and and we, we've uh, coined a phrase we call five, five, and five, and, and it really came out of the uh, Helsinki model for managing stroke. And so uh, partner site activates their stroke alert, uh, zero to five minute rapid medical assessment by the ED physician, and this zero means door, door to five minutes. Zero to five minutes patient to CT on EMS gurney. Then uh, zero to five minutes to where they call the Digging Hill Transfer Center at our 888 number. And uh, some, some of the, the sites say, why don't we wait till after the CT to call you or after we've uh, inserted a Foley catheter and different things. We say call sooner, uh, and if you're not sure, call. And our neurologists don't mind being on the robot, even if the patient's in CT, because they can gather a lot of information. So uh, these three factors, five, five, and five, we found have become very important. They're, it's not easy to do with everything going on in the ED, but uh, uh, a good percentage of our partner sites have, have been able to achieve this. So uh, uh, and once that 888 number is called, the Dignan Health Transfer Center pages the teleneurologist on call, as I mentioned. The teleneurologist, some of them will call back to the transfer center, as I said earlier, are patched in to speak to the local physician. Some of them just beam in, and that, that kind of depends on the partner side and the volume. So then the uh, uh, process continues. The consult is completed in collaboration with the partner site team. So uh, typically what happens is the, the uh, teleneurologist is beamed in, sees the patient, does their uh, assessment with the nurse assisting at the partner site. The ED physician is usually down the hall dealing with another crisis. So the uh, uh, once the evaluation is completed and the images have been looked at, the teleneurologist will request the local physician to come over to the robot and they'll have a conversation about what they're recommending. The partner site physician will actually enter in the orders. We don't enter in orders for our teleneurology program. Um, so, and then if there's a, the next uh, arrow down, the partner site physician and teleneurologist, if they agree to transfer, then the teleneurologist calls back to our transfer center. They initiate what we call the rapid transfer process. The transfer center contacts the transfer providers uh, that are that are uh, have a relationship with the partner site hospital uh, and check their availability with their ETA to the partner site. And so, uh, once they determine who's going to go, uh, the transport provider is sent to the partner site and our transfer center notifies the receiving hospital where the intervention or higher level of care is going to take place that they've got a patient. 
And so uh, we don't wait to verify if there's a bed. We will, uh, once we have uh, uh, to send the transport provider to the partner site. So once we, we agree to transfer, we'll send the closest transport provider, either by air or ground, and we say go to the partner site. Meanwhile, we're checking just to verify the availability of the bed, but we, won't, we don't wait to send them to the partner site until we have the bed, and then they go. And, and this has been something that's uh, improved our transport times a lot. So uh, then there's 15-minute updates, and then uh, every Thursday we review all of our transports. This is uh, some of the, the uh, training and sort of uh, instruction that we provide to the, trans the uh, partner sites. It's, uh, Always critical, we found in our programs that uh, there be a clear expectation on for, our, for the, the partner sites of what we expect and what they expect of us. And so we've drilled it down to things to try to make it real simple for them and for us because uh, we're dealing with a lot of different sites. The next one is stroke alert will also be initiated on uh, patients with any acute neurological deficits. As you know, it can be a, a, a a wake-up stroke, and so we need to make sure we're not missing an opportunity. Uh, and this, again, is uh, sort of an, a checklist for the partner sites of when to call. I, uh, we've sort of adopted a terminology we use, we call, or a phrase, we say checklist, uh, rather than policies, because checklists are, are easier to read, they're simple, and when you're, we're doing the instruction and training, it just makes it uh, clear for everybody involved. So this is when to call, here's when to call, and the phone number to call. And as I mentioned earlier, we've coined the phrase five, five and five, so this is some sort of marketing material. And then, uh, oops, also at the uh, partner site, this is a, a checklist that we work with. Our uh, Tammy Mitchell, the RN coordinator for the stroke program, will work with the partner site team on uh, this checklist, what to do. Uh, this isn't a document that goes in the chart. It's merely sort of a, uh, a, a cheat sheet to uh, be prepared with these things. And uh, uh, I understand the this presentation will be made available, so I won't read every item. You guys can look at it at your leisure. So the idea, we're all, we're all aware of that with telemedicine, is to try to keep the patients in their local facility. Um, but we do know that uh, over the last uh, year, there's now been uh, uh, seven plus definitive trials that demonstrate that endovascular reperfusion therapy is a standard of care. So uh, until that time, we, we knew it was the right thing to do. We just, we just couldn't put our finger that this is a, a standard. But now it is a standard of care. So once we evaluate these patients, we need to make sure that if there's an opportunity, we get them to an intervention center. And so this uh, next slide depicts that we've got uh, hub sites within our network that uh, have patients that, uh, that are closer for the patients to uh, get their intervention or higher level of care. One of the programs that we've adopted, I mentioned it earlier, we call it the rapid transfer process. And basically, you can see here, we've got uh, a, uh, the, the larger uh, graphic, the, the tele teleneurologist talking to the smaller graphic hospital, agree to transfer. The teleneurologist contacts the transfer center, who then uh, determines who is the closest uh, transport provider to the partner site hospital. Once they determine that, they say go, and that means go to the partner site hospital. Meanwhile, the transfer center is verifying there's a bed at the receiving hospital. As soon as they verify the bed, then the patient is sent. And we're actually uh, toying with some uh, GPS tracking devices that will go in so that we can follow the, uh, the, we know where the transport provider is in relationship with the partner site hospital and how uh, quickly they're getting transferred to the receiving hospital. And this is the same, same model, just with ground transport. Uh, once again, uh, to sort of uh, simplify what we do with our process, on the lower left, there's Dr. Schatzel who's beamed in at a partner site to see a patient. He completes his consult note, the top right graphic, and it's sent to the partner site either through a, uh, a cold feed drop or a, a PDF that drops in the chart or by fax. Uh, and eventually we'd like that 
uh, totally uh, seamless where it gets into the charts. And then something we're, we're proud of, this, uh, this secure web portal allows not only our, our stroke coordinator or, or, stro or uh, our end coordinator lead, but our partner site uh, quality people, stroke coordinators, to get access to the chart. And then on the bottom left, you see this stroke timeline report that's built into our clinical app that is populated, and I'll give you a better shot of it, that gets populated when the uh, teleneurologist does uh, uh, it was actually when the partner site first calls the transfer center. So the top line are automatically populated according to when their patient is admitted, and then the actual times get populated as the, the uh, chart gets completed and as the, uh, uh, the partner site goes in and enters some of their, their uh, met, uh, metrics data. And then, uh, so this tool that you're seeing there, the stroke timeline, then is take it to stroke committee meetings, uh, ED physician meetings, and our uh, telestroke medical director, Dr. Chowdhury, will beam in and review these cases with the partner side. And uh, we call this the headbanger. This was uh, our first run at putting the uh, RP Express in the paramedic vehicle. We've actually since uh, moved it to the back of the door, so it's out of the way. But it allows the, the uh, teleneurologist access to the patient in the field to get the uh, assessment going quickly. And there's, there's Jason uh, High in the sky doing a transport. So um, let me just mention a few of the, uh, the statistics that we look at. This is going back to 2013. You see we had 11 sites, did 1,013 consults. The average response time from the teleneurologist was six minutes. And then uh, for all of those sites, the percent who got who, uh, hit Jordan Neal times less than 60 minutes was 58%. Those that had a telestroke activation less than or equal to five minutes was 41%. And then another key indicator is recommended TPA to given uh, less than or equal to uh, 10 minutes, and 39% achieve that. And then I'm going to, you'll see the same metrics going forward to the next year, 2014, 16 sites, uh, kind of almost doubled the uh, volume, 2200, and you can see the metrics. And then to the fiscal year we just finished. 28 sites, and you can all see the metrics. Uh, and of course, we need to be concerned about finances. This is one of our sites before and after. I have uh, approximately 50,000 admits to their ED before the program. Uh, this is what they identified after the program. They uh, uh, before nine gas, uh, doses of TPA after 28. Looking at their contribution margin, which is uh, sort of the real real dollars and where the money hits the road. Um, you saw the, the return on investment is, is there. And there's a lot more uh, peripheral ancillary type income that is achieved, but this just gives you an idea. Uh, and the, uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, eight metrics that CMS requires now in, and uh, telemed telestroke really plays an uh, active role in uh, helping to meet these particular indicators. Uh, I'm going to let Jason talk about our tele-ICU round and respond model. Um, when we uh, first uh, began to explore tele-ICU, uh, one of our goals was to have an open model um, where the physician was not required to be in a specific location in order to uh, uh, care for the patient. And uh, our medical director, Dr. Schatzel, coined the term round and respond which uh, really means that we uh, round uh, daily on the patients um, and respond as requested. And so uh, uh, right now we have six tele-ICUs, uh, under five minute response time, which is important for the leapfrog requirements uh, in fiscal year 2015. Um, I, uh, we were uh, awarded an innovation award at the Catholic uh, Healthcare Association uh, annual meeting um, this year, which we're very proud of. And in the picture, you see Denise Pimentel, our tele-ICU RN coordinator, and Jim. Um, this is a, a actual uh, picture of, of patient rounds um, occurring. Uh, uh, these are the multidisciplinary rounds. You see uh, the on-site intensivist, 
um, at this remote hospital uh, behind the robot. The tele-intensivist is on the robot. And because the tele-intensivist is involved in the, in the daily rounds, when that on-site intensivist is not available, um, uh, they're not within the facility, that tele-intensivist is very familiar with the case and the patient and can respond appropriately to rapid needs. And um, uh, here's an example of Dr. Ali, one of our tele-intensivists, uh, connected to the robot and responding to a, a patient in need. Um, uh, so uh, then what we do with our, we use the in-touch health technology uh, uh, to be able to uh, see the patient and hear the patient and the, and the local team, as well as bringing in the Airstrip 1 technology, which adds in remote patient monitoring, uh, remote access, to the EMR, um, uh, uh, view access to the EMR, I should clarify, um, as well as imaging. And then uh, it's a 24-7, 365 service. So even if there is an on-site intensivist, maybe that in, uh, there's no, there are not enough intensivists to have 24-7 coverage, uh, but they can have partial on-site coverage in their uh, ICUs. Uh, we still are available 24-7 uh, to support as needed. So here's a, a comparison of transfers for one of our tele-ICUs between 2013 and 2014, and you see the uh, decrease in transfers out of the facility. Uh, by adding the tele-ICU program, it increased the local facility's confidence to maintain and hold on to their patients instead of transferring them out to a higher level of care. Here is a, a case study for a one-year comparison. And uh, what you notice here is the um, a decrease in mortality dear, uh, due to sepsis and shock. Um, you notice the uh, ventilator days decrease. The contribution margin addition um, was very significant. And then uh, the decreased readmission rate. One of the interesting things in this particular ICU, we were able to set up a telepulmonology clinic. Um, and so the patients are seen in the ICU by the teleintensivists who are pulmonologists. Then they're seen in follow-up in the outpatient clinic by the same pulmonologist. And, and we saw a dramatic decrease in readmission. And so I'm going to turn it back over to Jim for telemental health. Thanks, Jason. So uh, as of the uh, close of fiscal year, uh, that ended June 30th, we had 18 sites. We did 4,600 consults with a three-minute response. And this just gives you an idea of the uh, volume. Uh, here you can see uh, uh, fiscal year 15, uh, we ended last uh, June with 565 consults, uh, and the, uh, then below that in the lime green you can see holds placed, and then in the light uh, blue you see holds released. So 13% 13 of these patients have their holds released, and uh, 26 have the holds placed. Just, uh, this is a, a part of an email that I received from a social worker a while back. Um, one of our telemental health partner sites. Um, last night, she said she had a young man with his father come into the ED. as a 19-year-old son is beginning to experience active symptoms of his schizophrenia in the last week and beginning to decompensate because of it. Okay, so uh, again, this, this is a, a feedback we received on one of the patients. The, the social worker, uh, this is a part of an email she sent to me. She spoke to Dr. Nee on the line, presented the patient case, to her and the and the uh, uh, the beauty of the technology we we use allowed the telepsychiatrist to beam in on the the uh, telemedicine equipment and there's a privacy handset so the 19 year old patient could have a a, uh, a discussion with the telepsychiatrist within an hour the patient had the medication change avoided a, a, a hold 5150 we refer to it as and potential lengthy stay in the hospital so it was a really a, a neat success story, and we're happy when we see these. Let me describe what kind of happens, and many of you probably have seen this in your own hospitals. 
uh, a patient comes into the ED and, and uh, is, uh, has a behavioral health uh, issue. And so uh, we put them in a, a, a category of a behavioral health patient. And it doesn't really matter what their issue was. And we, we put them in a room or put them in the hall. And they wait. They wait for a crisis team member to come in, a social worker to come in, a psychiatrist to come in. And they sit there because the tendency is to not think of these patients as being sick. They just got a mental health problem. And, um, but we need to realize that, that uh, these patients, they have a, an issue, just as somebody would come in and a, with a, an asthma attack or a neurological deficit or a cardiac event. We need to uh, manage these patients a lot better. So um, we have, uh, we've actually uh, revised our workflow that we're actually in the process of uh, updating our sites with. And uh, before I say that, uh, I think we would all agree in patient health care that in, in healthcare, that all patients deserve high quality and timely care, regardless. Um, it, uh, it frustrates me personally when somebody has lung cancer and, and we have a tendency to blame them because they were a smoker, or somebody has a mental health issue and we just think, oh, you got to, uh, you know, it's your own problem. Uh, we, we need to uh, change our thinking there. So. Uh, uh, here's sort of the new uh, model that we're employing, and I, I want to mention that uh, one of the things that Jason and I are very proud of with our network is we're very real about what we do. You know, we're, we're proud of the good things that we've done, but we realize that there's a lot of things to work on, and we're constantly refining uh, our workflow and, and, uh, and how we do things. So recently we came up with this idea sort of uh, off of the tele-ICU model. We call it round and respond uh, for the for the emergency department patients. And so, uh, and basically rounding is, uh, and, it, and it depends on the volume of, of uh, behavioral health patients in the ED. If we've got a, only a few telemental health patients that come in, we're not going to do rounding. So rounding would be, for example, at 9 in the morning, at 4 in the afternoon, and maybe 10 p.m. at night, that the uh, partner site nurse or social worker gathers the information about those patients that have behavioral health issues in the ED, and the telepsychiatrist will beam in, and the, the partner site uh, social worker nurse will go room to room, and uh, uh, in an efficient manner, will have the telepsychiatrist do their evaluation. And it, it makes it a lot smoother uh, to uh, handle the workload that way. And then, uh, as Jason described, uh, we have the respond model. So if there's a sudden need that's 24-7, the telepsychiatrist can be activated. And uh, in a similar fashion, we, as I mentioned we create, earlier, we create checklists. And this would be a checklist for the partner side of when to call. Not going to read it. You can see it. Uh, and again, uh, checklist of when to call. What, what, the, what the partner site nurse needs to be prepared with when the uh, telepsychiatrist beams in. So uh, when I was working at one hospital as a uh, manager director or even a clinician, if you had an issue, you could walk over to the ICU, you could walk over to the pharmacy and sort of uh, get things uh, handled. But imagine being at uh, you know, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 sites and, and all the different uh, uh, clinicians at those sites. How do you effectively make sure that everybody's on the same page. And so this is what we've come up with. We develop these checklists so the nurse on the other end is ready when the, the telespecialist, or in this case, the telepsychiatrist beams in. Again, this is the uh, checklist, so I'm going to back up. So you've got to be ready with this stuff, be ready with this stuff. And then uh, I'm going to drill down a little bit more. Remember I showed you that box that everybody sort of is uh, a behavioral health patient, and they just go and sit. So uh, we developed this process, and it's taken us quite a while. We're actually in the in the implementation of revising our program with this new process. ED physician completes a rapid medical assessment. Uh, target is less than 30 minutes. The ED physician triages the patient uh, to mild, moderate, or severe. And this is a breakdown of what moderate would look like, or mild would look like. And again, it'll be in the handout you can have access to later. I'm not going to read it. Moderate, that's supposed to be yellow. Moderate, 
and then severe emergent. So, uh, so the, the new process will involve uh, a little magnet, and, and I think what we're going to do is change it to a little circle magnet. And I realize that in many places uh, yellow is a fall risk, so we're, we're, gonna, uh, we're having discussions, but we're probably just going to make that a little circle magnet. And so once we've stratified the patients, mild, moderate, or severe, on the uh, uh, door uh, uh, panel on the outside, we just put one of those magnets so that everybody's on the same page of uh, you know, how this patient has been prioritized. And here's a description of mild. Here's a description of moderate, yellow, and then severe. And then each of them would have a plan. So, uh, the mild might be, uh, you know, a uh, guy that uh, got drunk and shot his mouth off in a bar, and in the uh, the sheriff put a slapped a, a, a involuntary hold on him at 5150. But the ED physician can make that assessment and say, you know what, this guy, let's let him sleep it off and then send him home. And uh, 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 doesn't really need a telepsychiatrist consult; they can make the the decision themselves. And uh, those in California know that in every county that the uh, involuntary holds and holds are handled differently. So we have to work with the counties. And I think we're in about uh, 12 or 15 different counties with our 18 different partner sites. So we have to sort of uh, collaborate with them around who can lift the hold and who can place it. The moderate risk patient is really one that would need a, a telepsychiatry consult. And then the severe risk is somebody that needs placement and they may need a telepsychiatry consult or not. But, but, but you can see, rather than just having everybody in a, in a box, I'm going to back up here to make my point, having everybody in a, a box here, that uh, now we've said, well, let's, uh, let's use the expertise in ED to uh, stratify the patient, mild, moderate, or severe. And then we can more uh, logically address what their issue is and come up with a plan, as we're showing in this slide here. Uh, and then uh, here's a breakdown on the workflow. Uh, we're, we're getting short on time, so I'm not going to read it. You guys can see that yourselves. And the workflow essentially is uh, identical to the telestroke workflow. The doctor does their consult, completes the note, it gets into the chart. And, uh, and here we've, we've developed this. It's not, not uh, active yet, but we've developed a similar timeline uh, to the telestroke that this can be used as a quality assurance tool. Just to point out that uh, four hours is a joint commission requirement that you need to have a, 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 some type of uh, evaluation or plan in place for psych patients in the ED. And then these are the uh, this is our, our telehealth scorecard. Just to point out, this is difficult stuff to gather at our various partner sites. One of the big challenges uh, in telemedicine we face is how do you get this uh, data across uh, uh, many sites. Uh, just a sort of a financial overview, a hospital that has 30,000 visits. Uh, and we see the approximate uh, uh, cost is about $2,200. So when you look at 900 visits, uh, and this is related to what uh, a rough estimate of what dignity predicts for our ED visits, uh, 900 of those 30,000 would be telemental health visits. So there's a, a, a big significant loss, $1.9 million. And because there is some reimbursement that offsets it, we're, we see a lot of uh, money lost in the ED really because we're not managing these patients properly. And this is some literature that supports it. Actually, it was almost right on with what uh, we found in our research in terms of the cost. And I mentioned earlier the four-hour time frame that Joint Commission is uh, expecting us to handle, and that's a, a very tall order. Uh, and these are some future opportunities. Can we navigate these patients to home, to an FQHC clinic that reimburses for telepsychiatry, or to a psychiatric facility? And do you want to touch on this real quick? Yeah. We'll just go through real quick to, to finish out the continuum. Uh, for uh, patients that are in the home, um, we have a group of nurse practitioners who go to the home uh, to visit uh, patients that are chronically ill. Uh, and most of these patients cannot get into the doctor's office to see their geriatrician. So the nurse practitioner will bring a, a mobile uh, telehealth robot with them 
and the geriatrician can then beam in and see the patient remotely. Um, uh, and so uh, these are the um, uh, clinical scores for the for the various uh, 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 clinical issues. And I'll, uh, I'm going to skip past a lot of this stuff because we are running out of time. Uh, clinics, um, uh, we have a handful of uh, telemedicine clinics uh, that we're operating currently, and I mentioned one earlier in conjunction with our tele-ICU program. Um, uh, and we provide a variety of services in those clinics, such as neurology, pulmonology, psychiatry, um, and we're working to meet needs um, of other specialist services, such as pain management, which is a big need. Um, remote patient monitoring, I'm actually going to let Jim come back in because this is his baby. Okay. This is a tough one, uh, those of you that have attempted it, uh, because there's a lot of parts to this, but basically what we've uh, been working on for the uh, last couple of years is sort of refining our program, um, and this is the objective. It really is to uh, sort of empower and coach the patient at home to uh, uh, help them uh, uh, stay at home or uh, uh, where they live uh, with uh, uh, their vital signs being managed in, in, uh, in, in mostly self-managed so that they can, it's reported back to the, uh, the nurse or whoever is uh, doing the monitoring. So uh, this, is, this is kind of the, uh, what the program offers, and I'll let you read through it. So we really target uh, those patients that are, uh, have multiple chronic conditions. I think I've got a slide to show that, yeah. So multiple chronic conditions have, uh, you know, frequent readmissions to the hospital. Those are the uh, top 5% of the patients that keep coming back for their CHF or COPD that's not controlled. But they have to be willing to use the service. And, and we're finding, and as the population ages, they're getting a little more tech savvy. But we've also worked to make it simple. We've developed this package so the patient gets the, uh, the uh, box, which has everything in it. And you can see the four easy steps there. They uh, first they unpack uh, the device, they press on, they swipe go, and they press their start button. And it's already been pre-programmed uh, uh, according to the patient with their parameters for blood pressure and vital signs, et cetera. And so it's, uh, they get their scale, they get a blood pressure monitor and, and their, uh, their glucose monitor and oximeter as needed. This is, uh, I'm going to scroll forward to show you something a little better. This is a, a uh, early picture of uh, sort of when we were setting up the program so the, the health coach on the right is able to beam in, see the patient on the left at, at uh, uh, appointed times. And the, the person on the upper left who's the health coach is able to look at this dashboard, of a very, and those are not actual patients by the way, look at the dashboard of uh, various patients and see who's outside of their limits. And then on the bottom right, you can see, or in the middle on the right, you see the, the patient who's uh, showing his medications to the health coach and having a discussion around what's been going on. And, and at the bottom right are the little uh, uh, tabs that allow uh, a video visit. You, you don't just automatically have a video visit. You have to schedule it, and it's, uh, it's acknowledged by the patient before they can beam in. Uh, and uh, a lot of you are familiar with the new CCM. Uh, CPT codes. We're not we're not quite sure uh, how to figure this out yet. It pays about forty dollars, so there's a, uh, there's some criteria that's involved. You can look it up. I just sort of bullet pointed it. Billing requirements. And then I'm going to let Jason speak to this. I think this has been kind of secret to our success in terms of how we do our implementations. Okay, I'll go real quick on the implementation process. Um, we uh, once we have a new partner site that's accepted a proposal for service, we do an on-site kickoff meeting with all of the key players. And then to follow, we do weekly 30-minute meetings, usually via a WebEx-type uh, uh, technology. And um, we use an application called SmartSheet, which is an, basically a cloud-based spreadsheet, but it, we use it as a project management tool. And, Basically, we list all of our action steps on the smart sheet and who's responsible and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the expected completion date. And then 
that becomes our agenda on our weekly 30-minute meetings. And most of those meetings last about 10, maybe 15 minutes at the most because we use that smart sheet and it keeps us very efficient. Um, we meet with the, uh, we do the credentialing with the local sites. Um, we meet with their local physicians to discuss the program and answer questions and concerns. Um, we work through all of the technology um, and for our acute care sites, uh, in touch health, we uh, uh, helps us uh, with the installation of the robots. Um, uh, we uh, develop policies and procedures in conjunction with the local sites, and uh, and do all of the education mocks, and then we go live with the service. All in all, it takes about um, uh, three months, is what we typically say. We've done it as quickly as one month, um, but. Uh, but it's actually better if it takes a little bit longer. Make sure you, you get all the right people on board. And um, uh, this is why we do it, because every patient matters. And so that's the end of our slideshow. And I'll try to turn the screen up back over. Oh, never mind. They already did it. Thank you. So uh, thank you all very much for thank your you. time today. Yeah, thanks so much, Jim and Jason. Um, we're, we have a few questions that uh, have come in from the audience, and uh, we're going to go through those right now. One of the questions was, um, uh, this is from Paul. He asked, how do you structure your business agreements with partners? Uh, and I, 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 I'm going to read into what I, I think the question is. So we, we set it up so that the... Uh, the partner side on the acute setting, and we're moving this on the cl clinic setting, that they pay for the service. We don't do any third third party billing. Um, but And there's reasons behind that, uh, getting a specialist in their community and so forth. But So we, we set it up that way. And uh, uh, that's, that's I, I think, Paul, that was where you, where you were going with the question. Um, but the partner side, and in California, you can employ the doctors directly, so the partner side actually pays to the Dignity Health Telemedicine Network. We take a small fee for our services, and then we pay the specialists. Great. Thanks, Jim. Um, so another question from Paul was, do you have a methodology for identifying programs for development and, and, and then sort of online that which additional service lines are you seeing growing most rapidly right now? Uh, Jason's giving me a dirty look because we always just say yes. Uh, actually, it's been very interesting. What started with a, a hyperacute stroke program is, is we had little successes. We never really advertised. We had somebody say, can you do this? And telepsych was a, a, was a very good example of that. So as the the need arises, then we work to develop solutions around it. And I, and I will say something that we always talk about. It really is about identifying the need, identifying the service that will meet that need, creating the workflow around that, and then layering on the technology. And, and I think those that have experience with telemedicine, you guys can all uh, vouch that, that you have to do it that way. You can't start with setting up uh, a telemedicine cart and expect things to work. Okay, great. So we have um, we have a question, uh, Jim uh, and Jason, around uh, you mentioned the clinical apps, and uh, the the question was from Dr. Lem. He was uh, he was asking around um, you know you mentioning the clinical apps for documentation, and he and uh, I think one of the things to just announce just to let him know is that. These clinical apps are, are a, a, a third party or are a, a product that you utilize with InTouch. And he also asks about how do you get the data to and from the EMR, EHR system. So maybe you can talk just briefly about how you guys utilize the clinical apps from a workflow perspective, very briefly. Yeah, Jason and I are going to answer that. That's a very good question. One of the things that I realized early on when we had four sites is I would have the uh, the teleneurologist log in or dictate into the partner site's EMR. And you can imagine trying to remember passwords and how to get access and so forth. It became quickly a nightmare. So uh, we worked with InTouch on creating this uh, clinical app, and I'm going to let Jason speak to that. 
Well, it, it started out as what was called Stroke Respond, which was basically just a, a cloud-based stroke note, documentation note. And it's evolved into the clinical apps system, which has a variety of specialist notes available. We use um, a stroke, mental health, and uh, we do a little bit of tele-EEG, uh, which is a separate note in that system. And then, um, so that's all completed in the online cloud-based system by the physician. They only need one username and one password for all their documentation for telemedicine. Then uh, we, we've done uh, work with InTouch and also uh, with some of our partner sites that are using Cerner as their EMR and done a data integration so that the note that is signed in clinical apps will feed into Cerner directly as a PDF note. And we're working right now on doing the same thing with our first uh, site that uses Meditech. That should be done in the next uh, two to three weeks, and then um, uh, and then uh, we're. Uh, I think after that, the plan is for Vista and integration with Vista. And I'll just uh, add one more thing there. So, so basically, the workflow is when the partner site calls to the Digging Health Telemet Transfer Center and says we have a patient here with hyperacute stroke. The transfer center specialist enters the demographic information into what eventually becomes the consult note. So, so when the neurologist beams in to the partner site and is virtually there, on their screen is also that template, the stroke template, telestroke uh, consult note, Jason referred to it as, as the stroke respond note. As the neurologist is doing their evaluation, their NIH assessment, et cetera, et cetera they're keying it in on this consult note. Uh, and, and and part of that is we are actually set up at most of our partner sites the ability to query their image pack system so that the neurologist can see the patient, see the images, and have the consult note which they they've, uh, are populating as they're doing evaluation. They sign it, and then it electronically gets into the chart in various ways as Jason described. So it makes it a, a real simple workflow. And in order to be successful in telemedicine, you have to create a sort of a quote-unquote telehealth uh, EMR uh, because you can't have, as I described earlier, the telespecialist trying to get into all the EMRs. Now for our telenephrology program and for tele-ICU program, we actually have them getting into the EMR because there's a lot of data that they need to look at, so we've been flexible that way. Great. Hey, hey Jim and Jason, thank you for that detailed response. and. Uh, we have a couple of follow-up questions for that. We're not going to have time to get to those questions. Uh, Larissa is going to put the next slide up right here, and I just want to note that uh, for those that have just uh, uh, sent in additional questions around uh, the clinical apps, Jim and Jason can talk a lot more detailed about that. You can email them at dhtn at dignityhealth.org. Uh, I, I don't want to force you guys to give very quick, uh, short answers and I do want to be respectable of people's timing. I did have one. I did have two more questions that I think you guys can answer pretty quickly. And um, those, uh, the the one question was regarding the home kit. This is from Jeffrey Espinoza. He was wondering who is the vendor and does it have the ability to track uh, glu uh, glucometry? <laughs> yeah, Jeffrey, we've. Uh, <laughs> The uh, company is Care Innovations. They're a GE and Intel company that were formed about four or five years ago. And uh, uh, it doesn't directly interface, but uh, so at this point, the patient has to enter their glucometer, glucometry reading, reading, glucose readings into the device. But uh, very soon, I know there'll be a, a, a low, low uh, voltage uh, Bluetooth uh, connection with uh, some uh, glucometer devices out there. Okay, and then the, the last question before we wrap up, um, around the billing, have you, what, what has been your success, uh, just very quickly, around billing with different types of payers, or have you had more success with certain payers, or, or, um, and less success with others? Yeah, that's a, we don't do billing. We actually charge the partner oh. site, or for the uh, rural clinics, we set up as a block payment, because uh, those that have access to do it on their cost report, they set it up that way, and that's kind of a long story we can answer if you guys contact us later. But 
we really work to make the doctor whole. And because we're in many sites, the amount that the partner site pays is very low. So it's easy on their pocketbook, so to speak. But it goes into the pot and allows us to make the telespecialist whole uh, to separate them just to do telemedicine. That's, the, that's sort of the short answer. All right, Jim, thanks so much. Uh, again, thanks a lot to Jim and Jason for all of your uh, content and knowledge today. And I think we could have continued to go on for you know, another hour at least. Um, and thanks as well to Dignity Health uh, as one of our partners. As I mentioned, additional questions can go in either to us or to uh, Jim and Jason directly. And we will have a uh, recording of the webinar and a, and a list of our upcoming webinars. You can find them on our website at uh, intouchhealth.com, and you can navigate to telehealth resources webinars. Uh, that information will be available for you. Uh, after we disconnect, uh, everybody should have a short survey that they can fill out. If you uh, enter that information, you can add additional questions there. So at this point, we are going to end. And again, thank you very much. Thank you.